So my name is Chris at Accelerize, and today we're going to talk about one of our products called Array Fire. It is a C++, Fortran, Python, etc. library for GPU computing. Um, one of our other products is called Jacket. It supports running MATLAB code on the GPU. And both libraries support CUDA and OpenCL. Our CUDA version is much more advanced right now, but we will get to that later. But today we're going to talk about ArrayFire and some applications for using ArrayFire with machine learning applications. So an outline of today, we're going to get into a little bit of intro of what ArrayFire is used for and what that looks like. And then we'll get to some demos at the end. So let's first start out by talking about GPU computing in general. So ideally, we want program programmability scalability, portability, performance, and community all to be together in the GPU software library. So going back in time, we have the options for using libraries such as SSC or AVX. These are really low level. You can get writing kernels, you can do compiler directives, and using libraries. Each one of these has a trade-off between performance and ease of program programmability. Using libraries tends to be the nice balance between all of this. And this is where ArrayFire sits. So some of the community, Accelerize is pretty, pretty, pretty hot in the GPU forums. We have our own forums. It stays pretty active compared to some other forums out there. Portability, ArrayFire uses CUDA backend and OpenCL. There's two different versions. So you, you can run on any NVIDIA card, and with OpenCL, it can run on any OpenCL graphics card, and including deep GPUs that support OpenCL. In scalability, you want there to be, um, you want to be abstracted from multi-GPU machines as much as possible, and ArrayFire can handle multi-GPU computing very easily. So getting into some other software tools out there. You can break these down into categories. There's compiler directives, raw kernels, and GPU libraries. Um, compiler, compiler directives will be something like OpenACC. Raw kernels would be something more like CUDA. And GPU libraries would be where ArrayFire sits. So, in production, you see stuff in Pragmas, compiler directives, uh, OpenACC, PTI, Silk, and some research libraries using compiler directives, or stuff like Reservoir and Ocelot. If you want to use raw kernels for GPU computing, your options are standard CUDA and OpenCL. And then some research options are stuff like RenderScript and Direct Compute and C recently C++ AMP. So getting to GPU libraries, ArrayFire sits here. It's built on top of CUA, NVIDIA libraries, and AMD libraries. And in research, you have libraries such as Thrust, NTP, OpenCV has some GPU stuff now including the point cloud library. So ArrayFire is on the left, and Thrust is on the right. 
you can see here in this example that for the what we're doing here, we're looping through and doing summations over vectorized rows of this matrix. And you can do this in three lines. And in thrust, it takes a little bit more effort to do the same functionality of just a simple loop sum. So an additional comparison for array fire and thrust. You can see here that array fire is pretty up there in performance, uh, usually generally many or orders of magnitude faster than using thrust for the same same kernel, same basic function, um, primitive. And also a note that array fire is using supports matrices while thrust is generally vector oriented. So you can see here how array fire can be used in, in combination of each one of these options for GPU computing where array fire can fit right into any code using prag code that uses pragmas or raw and CL or use other libraries. Um, array fire has been used in many different applications, real world applications and research applications from many different companies each one achieving significant speed up in their projects or applications. Here are just a few that are highlighted here. So next we'll get into what ArrayFire looks like. ArrayFire is built around the concept of an array. It's a unified data structure supporting floating point, L precision, Boolean, complex, all these things. It is also n-dimensional, like I mentioned earlier about thrust being one-dimensional. Array fire is n-dimensional, 1D, 2D, 3D, and so forth. The data types are Notice here is B8 for Boolean byte. It's really just a Boolean, but it's stored as a byte. And 64, C64 and C32 are complex, and F64 and F32 are floats and double precision. Array file also acts, allows you to do easy array subscripting, where you can access rows, columns, elements slices, volumes, all very intuitively and easily. We, a key, you see on the screen a keyword called span, and that gets an entire row across that dimension. So what does this look like? So array fire, you can see here, is a simple program. We just want to include arrayfire.h, and we use the namespace af. And really, these two lines here are the main thing. We see we have, we're using a function called randu, which generates some random points and stores them in a matrix. And then we go down here and compute um, where these points lie within a semicircle, and to estimate the value of pi, we want to generate a bunch of random points and see how many fall within the unit circle. And the area of that will be an approximation of pi. So you can see here how simple and compact you can make the array fire notation. And all this is running in the GPU. So array fire also has Fortran and Python bindings you can use to interrupt as well. If you have Python code or Fortran code or C code, you can use this as well. And these are just a few examples of what how that might be used. So one thing to note is this concept of G4, which is unique to Array Fire and Jacket and Accelerize. Um, you can think of G4 as short for being GPU for loop, where you want 
it really significantly speeds up a for loop. And so a standard for loop in this in, in, this, in this example for three iterations you do this all sequentially, one at a time. But if you use a G4 loop, each one of these happens simultaneously. All these um, multiplications will happen at once instead of sequentially. So this significantly speeds up performance. You can also think of as array fire interpreting these as a volume over the dimensions behind the scenes for you. So it all happens at once. And this is significantly faster. And this is unique to array fire and similarly in jacket. And some other notes on this is that it's really, it's very like, it's much like vectorizing your code, but in a sequential fashion. And so it's really simple to get big performance without much syntax change for your code. And similarly, if you want to get more performance by scaling out to multiple GPUs, you can do that really easily with array fire simply by using the device keyword. And this will change which GPU you're on. And then every command after that will be run on that GPU. And all this, in this example, we're just dispatching out a bunch of work in a for loop. And all that happens in parallel. And the memory management is taken care of through array fire. Array fire includes lots of functions, lots of primitives to use, and even up in higher level stuff like image processing and linear algebra. There's standard reductions, convolutions, interpolation, sorting, and many, many more. All at a very high level and easy to use. Some examples of some performance gains you may get by using array fire. Here, matrix multiply sum. Similarly, with convolutions, these are much faster. These are compared to IPP. And same with sort and sum, comparing them similarly with MKL and IPP. Another reason you may want to consider using array fire is that it'll reduce all the complex GPU coding as far as raw kernels and such. So you can focus on building a more elaborate application than spending all your time worrying about the, the GPU code involved. So this helps you reduce time and less um, production costs. One of the ideas behind array fire is that the the back end is something that Accelerize deals with and is constantly is improving. So you never have to worry about um, different GPU architectures. You don't have to worry about taking advantage of that yourself. So we will we will improve array fire with each release and it supports new GPUs and functions get more optimized for that GPU. Each, each new generation, so you don't have to worry about this. You just your code just gets faster by upgrading array fire. There are many, several different options for downloading array fire. We offer a free version, which is one GPU, or you can get professional versions with multi GPUs if you want to scale out. And there's also packages for linear algebra and such. So now we get to the machine learning demos. I will be doing alt tab to Visual Studio here to run some examples. First, we'll get to this. We're going to run a neural network example. Let me hit play here. This example is loading in and training on images. We have two different, or three different images of AMD and three different images of an Intel logo. And these are being trained by neural networks 
to decide, is this an AMD logo or is this an Intel logo? And so here's a nice visual. We went through 200 iterations of training. And we're able to train on three different images. And we do use a different test image to test against. And so up here, you can see there is, on, on the left side, at the top of the image, it says 0.89 AMD and 0.1 Intel. That's essentially the output of the neural network confidence that this is an AMD image. 89% sure this is AMD. And over on the right, it is saying that it's 82% sure this is Intel. So let me go back through the code here, show you a little bit of how simple this is in array fire. Remember, all that was running in the GPU. And so here, I'm going to highlight some code here. This is where we load in some images. It's just simple. Get three AMD images, three Intel images. Let's go down here and initialize some weights, some expectations. We're saying that this is just to connect that we expect the Intel one to be Intel, AMD to be AMD. And then we go down here and we do these trainings. This code highlighted is before we do the training. We train for 200 iterations in this example. So let's take a deeper look at this train. Up above here, going up, we have train. So for each one of the images, we want to go back through and do what's called a backwards propagation to get our x, our hidden variables and weights. This is a three-layer network where we have input weights and output weights. And this is what backwards propagate is going to figure out. So go scrolling up some more, we have a this is a pretty clever way to reduce this to a matrix multiplication to get just summing over all the weights for each one of the of the nodes here. And then we come down here and get the derivative. Oh, this code up here is returning the error for each layer. So we're saying this is a this is an image. You push back through the weights, you sum them up, and you get an error, and you see how different they are than what you expect. And so we correct the weights using the gradient. And then come back down here. And that's our training. We're basically doing this over and over and over, is that we're reevaluating all the weights and correcting for the error for here, in this case, 200 iterations. So those are our samples and expectations calculations. So when this is done, you come down here and you load in a different test image. And then we do a forward propagate, which is essentially taking these images and pushing them through the network with the weights that we trained on to get the result. So scrolling up a bit. Our forward propagate right here. We simply get the weight by doing the matrix multiplication. You apply the activation function to each one. And remember, all these operations are vector operations and matrix operations. So there's a, a lot of each pixel represents one of the input weights, and the output weights are 0 and 1. I'm sorry, there's, there's also 256 hidden nodes. I should mention that. And that's what we are training against. So then we come down here and get the output values, and then apply the activation function again. And then that's we'll output a 0, 1 for each image to see if it's AMD or Intel. And then we display it. So that is 
neural networks. Another example will be k-means. We run this here. K-means, this example is loading in an image and essentially clustering grayscale values into three clusters. We have k equals three right now. So it's computing three different means of this input image, and then finding those means, and then shifting the colors to be those means. So this is a really good example of usually it's used in image segmentation or stuff like that For in this example for images. You can see here that on the, the right, the image has been shifted in several places to the closest mean value. And we did this for three three means. So it's it's essentially posterizing the image into three different colors in this instance in this instance. You can set this to two if you want a binary segmentation or really any number of K. So let's go through and see what this looks like in the code. So this one's relatively short here. Go down here to k-means demo. We simply load in an image, we run k-means. k-means is up here. So what we're doing, we're getting the min and max of the inputs. They want to create a histogram of all these values that are normalized um, between the min and the max. And so what we're doing is we go through and we iterate over the current classification. For each pixel has a classification. And we keep going through and iterating over what what is the current mean, what is the current three means of the image, and then we keep shifting all the weights over. So we recalculate means here. We get our current classification, current classification up here, and this is iteratively done for until there's convergence, essentially, where the so there's no more changes, there's nothing being shifted around. So, and here you can see a good use of G4, where all this is happening in parallel. We're getting our current classification and updating our histogram counts over the entire image all at once. So when this is done, we go back and reset, reshift our calculations out to the original, because we reset them to zero up above. We shifted it down. And we come down here, and we can also get the mask. So essentially, we this is where we apply our means to the image. So we have our data coming in here, our image, and the means vec, which is the computed means of the image, and then k. And so there's another use of G4 right here. Again, this is all happening at once. We're computing a volume of the differences between the current pixel value, so the, the normal grayscale value, versus its mean. So you want to find the close, the index. Now here we find the index that gets us the mean closest to that difference. Or sorry, the the mean that minimizes the difference between the pixel value and that mean. And so we return the mask, and that was what we displayed above in the example. So this is k-mean. Let's go to another example. Here we go. Here's Another one that's a, lot of a good buzzword is genetic algorithm. And in this example, we're going to create a hill. You run this. We create a simple little hill that we want a bunch of um, test points to start climbing up and reach the top. And we're going to see this output in a second. So this might be a little hard to see, but here is our green little hill. 
and you may see little dots floating around. And so those are our sample points trying to reach the top of this hill. I'm going to click enter over here. Basically, it'll it'll stop once a point reaches the top. We can hit enter to let this re go. So I'll, I'll look at the top down. You may be able to see dots floating around. There we go. And so each iteration, we're taking a bunch of sample points and then running the genetic algorithm on those points to find the best ones, the best ones being the ones closer to the top, and then doing the mutations and so forth until one gets to the top. Then we restart over. So let's see what that looks like in the code. This one's rather involved, actually. But so the main thing here is these really two lines. We we have a while loop saying while one of the samples is not at the top, we want to reproduce through, through the genetic algorithm. And so we come up here to that function. And let's see, it all fits on the screen here. Simply, we take our parents, we get we sample all the points, we split this in half, take all the x's and y's and split them in half. We do a um, crossover and do some bit masking right here. This will give us our children. We take like the left side, like the left mask and the right mask of the parents, and flip them around to get children. Join these back together, and then we create our, we mutate the children here. We simply flip a random bit in the array, and then we set them back to these examples, and then we update. Let's see, update. Update is really just putting the examples back. And so really this is the main meat of the code is that you're taking the top percentage to be the parents. You're splitting them in half and switching the bits around, which is here for the children. And then we take a random bit and you mutate the children and you say these are what my new sample is. And this iterates over and over until one of them reaches the top. And this is, in that case, that's what in the demo has to be restarting. So you can see here that this is pretty simple. It all fits on one little screen here to do genetic, genetic search algorithms in array fire. And all these are vector operations on the GPU. So going to our last example here, which will be PCA, or Principal Component Analysis. This is the shortest of the demos. I'm going to run this to show you an output. Really, this example is has a data set, um, kind of a contrived data set of lines and various properties for each line. And what we're doing here is that on the left, we're taking really essentially just kind of random points of this data set and displaying it. Where there's each wine has 14 different properties, and we're taking some the first three properties and plotting them over here. And on the other side, we take the principal component analysis of that data set and then plot the top three um, components. You can see here that it may not be too clear, but this data set, you can start to see a more definition of where where interesting properties might be in your data set. This tends to look like more like a line. There's, there's some trend line being followed over here based on the top three principal components over here really unclear what's going on. Although over here, it's, it's still some noise in the other direction. But 
can clearly see you get a different view of your data set by running principal component analysis on it. So that's useful for that sort of thing. So let's go back and see what this might look like. This is really pretty short here. The, the thing all it's really doing is loading in a data set up here, which is in a header file. It's 14 dimensions, 178 lines, all with various properties. And then we can run this PCA function. And then all down here we do is just plot it. And so PCA up here. The, all you do is you take the data and you normalize it over its standard deviations and means. And then you decompose the data and run, you take the covariance of the data and you get the top eigenvalues for it. And all these functions are an array fire. This example specifically requires, or eigen requires the, the linear algebra package of array fire. And you go through and you sort the most popular eigenvectors, or the top, most the strongest eigenvalues. And you come down here and you output the data. You see the principal components, sorted eigenvalues, principal components, the normalized input. All these are outputs of this function. And this is just built using array fire. There's nothing really special about the way it's structured. But you can just see that how simple it is to do pretty complex things in just a few lines of code with array fire. And then we come back down here and display it. So that is PCA demo. Let me bring you back here to the PowerPoint slide. So and also a side note, again, as mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, that Accelerize offers a MATLAB GPU library called Jacket, which allows you to run MATLAB on the GPU. Um, so ArrayFire and Jacket are two products. So this brings us to the end. We say, I want you to get ArrayFire, and this is when we'll open up the floor for questions and discussion. Thank you. So a question over here I see, is the code available for download? Not yet, but the all these examples and more are included in the next version of ArrayFire as part of the examples package of ArrayFire. So all these will be in the next release of ArrayFire, and that will be coming out really soon. Would say next week sometime. That is very, very nearly launched. So yes, all these will be just how you saw them in the next version of ArrayFire. So I see a question here about if there's help available. Actually, we do have a broad, a nice set of forums and support frameworks. And can, we also can offer consulting for all of our products. And if you have any questions, you can it's pretty pretty safe to get on the forums and ask them those are responses, or you can call and get some support. Or if you have a broader consulting um, sort of deal you want to work out, we also we offer consulting services as well using all of our products. Okay, our telephone number for the support line is eight hundred five seven zero one nine four one, and there's also email support. And you can email support at accelerize.com for that. Okay, again, all these examples will be in the next release of Array Fire, which is coming very soon. So stay tuned. And with that, we thank you for attending the webinar. And so please go check out Array Fire. Thank you.